Hey! Everybody's always telling me to wear a different shirt. Well, here's a different shirt. I don't like this shirt. It's a polo shirt, but it looks like old man's pajamas or something. I don't know why I bought it. I never buy expensive shirts. I remember the shirt being astronomically expensive. Most expensive shirt I've ever bought. I regret buying it. But it's a different shirt. Everybody says, when are you going to wear a different shirt? <laughs> One of the things people keep asking me about is uh, the plane of inertia. And I'm not referring to the flurfers or the people that are in flatism. But they hijack that word and they don't understand it. I've used uh, the plane of inertia just as Walter Russell accurately used the plane of inertia. But also, too, many people have said that I'm using large words, and I'm really not. I just have a large vocabulary, and these are not conventional words that people use, such as plane of inertia. Constructive and destructive should be really simple. I'm talking about constructive and destructive interference, but to explain what's going on, and of course this has existed for countless thousands of years. Everybody with a PhD in academia, every one of them, will tell you that, yes, magnetic attraction, magnetic repulsion, you know, this, this is an accepted reality. People don't understand polarization either. When you actually say polarized, I love it when people say monopole too, because that's really funny. Because it is impossible to even, like a unicorn or a leprechaun, which you could imagine one, even though they don't exist. Nobody could imagine a pole of any variety in their head that only has one end. What about a monopole? Like, what? A pole, by definition, has two <laughs> That's all when people say magnetic monopoles. Like a, a pole with only one end, right? Try to imagine one. Just, I dare you. I'll give you a thousand bucks if you could mentally picture one. You don't have to draw it out. Put you, hook you up to a lie detector test. See if you could tell me if you can imagine a monopole. Completely impossible, of course. Now, what is polarized? Yes, I talk about the plane of inertia, which of course does exist. You can see it with magnetic viewing film. I have some right over there. You can see it underneath the supercell. Literally, it's the midpoint between the fighting, and I don't mean they're literally fighting, between the conjugate fields of the magnetic and the dielectric. Magnetism, of course, is a dielectric field. Loss of energy or inertia of the dielectric manifests as this toroidal geometry. The inverse of the toroidal geometry, the same as this hourglass shape here, is a hyperboloid. Negative image of a hyperboloid is a torus. Negative image of a torus is a hyperboloid. So I'm going to make this really simple so that people are able to understand it a lot better. What is undeniable around any magnet, and it's not being emitted by the magnet, it's the nature of the kora. Kora is the Greek word for field, except in this case we're not actually talking about a field. Since a field is an ether perturbation modality, rather the influence of the substrate of a field, and the substrate of a field, of course, is the ether. The substrate of magnetism is a dielectric. The loss of energy or inertia manifests as a three-dimensional force vector, which is the toroidal geometry of magnetism. So undeniably, everybody in academia will agree that what exists around a magnet is a magnetic field. And yet this crazy idea of magnetic attraction exists. It's like, well, that's completely impossible. It would be ridiculous if we have two unlike polarities here and then they accelerate. Well, there's a magnetic field around each one of these magnets. But if we actually uh, stick uh, inverse polarities pointing towards one another, they will accelerate. That's magnetic attraction. Well, it's completely ridiculous. Magnetism is a three-dimensional force toroidal geometry. It is literally the field of force. It is expansive. A toroid is nothing other than a type of balloon, right? Of course, we all know what a torus is. That is the magnetic field. Yeah, but when they accelerate towards one another, it's like a deflating balloon. Imagine an imaginary balloon between these two things. It is quickly deflating, and they accelerate towards one another. It's like, well, we could talk about a torus or a deflating balloon between these two, but if we actually put a torus between these two, it would be at the center of the torus where, you know, you see the hole in the center of the supercell or the ferrocell, which I've got over a thousand videos. That's increasing inertia and acceleration. Magnetism, by definition, is force. There's no such thing as magnetism that is force, and then a different type of magnetism that is inertia and acceleration. 
we're actually talking about constructive and destructive interference. So number one, we have no bone of contention with any of the, uh, the fools of academia. The physicists say, yes, what's around a magnet is a magnetic field. It's like, okay, let's agree upon that at least. What they don't understand is they've never defined polarization. They've never defined the word field or energy, by the way. We have either multiplicative magnetism where we have two like poles where you're actually sitting there trying to push them together. and No matter how much force you apply, you can't even get them close to one another. This, of course, is multiplicative magnetism. We actually have constructive interference. We have two balloons competing with one another. In the case of a field balloon or a torus, we actually have these lines of force, which don't mean anything. There's no lines in nature. And all lines in nature are really curved linear. And force of what, by what, and upon what. So we actually have two competing toroids where the more we try to push them together, the more force that has to be applied to even get them slightly closer together. So we have multiplicative or additive, it's not additive actually, it's multiplicative force i.e. multiplicative magnetism. Well, what happens when we turn them and we have inverse polarity, you know, north here and south here, or north here and south here, and then, of course, not only do you need not apply any force to get them together, they will jump towards one another and even break your fingers if you've got a powerful enough one between two large enough of ones. Well, that can't be magnetism. What would that be? That would be multiplicative dielectric, would it not? What is accurate, but is only partially accurate around every magnet is a toroidal field of magnetism. What is also around every magnet is this hyperboloidal, you can put the magnet right here, right right in the middle there. We have this hyperboloidal hourglass, and right here is the plane of inertia, right here. That's the lowest pressure mediation between the fight between the magnetic and the dielectric. Everybody knows these magnets are accelerating towards, well, that's magnetic attraction. There's a magnetic field around the magnet, and the two magnets are accelerating, therefore we're going to call it magnet... Every book on Earth and every bit of academia affirms this thing called magnetic attraction. Well, the phenomena is undeniable. They'll jump towards one another, they'll even break your fingers if they're powerful enough, but it's impossible for that to be magnetic. Magnetism cannot be both the toroidal force vector of magnetism, which of course it is, and also this uh, hyperboloidal acceleration between both, which is additive. So we actually have constructive interference, which is constructive uh, multiplicative, not additive, multiplicative force. And yet when we actually do inverse polarity, we not only don't have force, we have acceleration. We have the complete opposite of force. What's the opposite of force? Inertia and acceleration. This is the centripetal geometry of the toroid, of the hyperboloid, excuse me. So around each and every magnet is not only the toroidal geometry of uh, the magnetic field, but the hyperboloidal geometry of increasing inertia and acceleration. This is the inverse of the multiplicative force geometry of two like polarities. What's the inverse of a multiplicative force geometry where we actually have construct, I mean destructive, uh, excuse me, constructive uh, force interference? constructive force interference of like two like polarities. We actually have destructive force or increasing inertia and acceleration. We actually, we could say constructive dielectric or we could say destructive magnetism or tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Either one would be accurate. But anyway, there's a conjugate field around each and every magnet. So force and acceleration versus inertia and acceleration. The polarization of what? Polarization of the field. We have polarization of the object. We have polarization between dielectricity and the field of dielectricity in loss, which is that thing we call magnetism. When we have polarization, we have polarization of the two conjugate fields. Everything is working in unison. We have a, and by the way, a magnet is no different than saying a field laser. That is what a magnet is. It's a point source object because a magnet is not quantitative, it is qualitative. Before this becomes a magnet, <coughs> it is quantitatively identical before as it is after. The only thing that's actually changed is its qualitative nature. So a polarized field. Polarized field, of course, means either multiplicative magnetism or multiplicative dielectric, depending on actually how you have the two separate magnets directed at one another. 
But what is really interesting, and the plane of inertia, the plane of inertia, say these are two magnets, but it doesn't matter if I'm talking about like polarity or unlike polarities, whether accelerating towards one another or actually have uh, added to force, the plane of inertia exists right here in the case of uh, destructive magnetism. It's forming right there. This is no different than gravity. You can actually see that underneath the supercell. I have countless different demonstrations of that. So you have constructive force and destructive force. Destructive force is what these, these foolish people in academia and what has been talked about for thousands of years is uh, what they're incorrectly calling magnetic attraction. This is no different than gravity. Gravity is just non-point source, i.e. incoherent mutual mass acceleration. But in the case of two objects, they're not accelerating towards one another. People make the same mistake of so-called magnetic attraction, which is not magnetism at all, as they do between two masses accelerating. Yeah? Well, they're accelerating towards one another. No, they're actually accelerating towards the null pressure point, which is between the two, which is ether rarefaction. Ether rarefaction is the plane of inertia. Let me repeat that again for those just wanting to think in terms of a magnet. Uh, the plane of inertia here, you can see it with magnetic viewing film. I have some right over there. I don't know if anyone will go and grab it. I've got countless demonstrations with that. What would be the plane of inertia? Well, we, since you've already said many times in countless videos that that's the lowest pressure point between the magnetic and the dielectric, which of course it is. But that's where ether rarefaction is. Why are these objects accelerating? It's not a bent space-time. So just, let's carry on this logically here. Mutual mass acceleration towards, not towards each other. Magnets are not accelerating towards one another, which is not magnetism, by the way. Nor are they accelerating towards one another. There's no difference between mutual mass acceleration in the terms of the phenomena called gravity and that which is called magnetic attraction, which is not magnetism at all. And they're not accelerating towards one another, either in the case of the magnets or in the case of the mass. Magnets are just polarized entities. They are field lasers, which is, and a laser is just a point source object. That's what a magnet is, is field laser. When I say laser, I'm talking about a point source uh, phenomena. Uh, magnetism, lasers, black holes, there's other examples. Yeah. Point source. Same as gravity. Both are accelerating towards ether rarefaction, not towards each other. If you could erase out of your brain the idea that magnetic attraction exists, since magnetism is definitionally force in motion and the centrifugal force vector, this idea that masses accelerate either uh, towards, uh, well, and then we see an object accelerate towards a black hole, we just talk about like the Cavendish experiment or mutual mass acceleration in the, in the case of either comets or heavenly bodies where they do accelerate Everybody observationally and accurately sees them accelerating towards one another, but they're not. I cut my hand, by the way. That's why I got a Band-Aid on my hand. Someone's going to ask me that. They're not accelerating towards one another. They're accelerating towards ether rarefaction, which exists between the two objects right here. Well, there's nothing there. Nothing demonstrably visible or objective there. But why are the two objects accelerating towards this null pressure point between the two? You see, when I do this and I'm speaking about gravity or mutual mass acceleration, is no different than me talking about so-called magnetic attraction, which is A, not magnetism, nor are the magnets accelerating towards one another. What we actually have is multiplicative dielectric or deconstructive of magnetism. In other words, the deflation of the toroidal geometry of magnetism. I ask anybody on this earth, anybody with any PhD, anybody in academia, to so define to me what polarization means in the case of a magnet. Well, a magnet has two poles, north pole and a south. You didn't explain anything. You just gave a description of what, every, even, what even a child knows. Well, what's polarization? Polarization of what? What is being polarized? Well, we have domain alignment. Well, that's also too descriptive. You've done a little bit better, but you still haven't explained anything. And that's exactly what they'll do. I've been debating these people for ages. Yeah, you have domains lined up. That's what's going on. No, no, you gave a, you know, a semi-accurate 
description. A magnet, of course, is qualitative, and I can walk them down that. So I agree with you. You know, a magnet is quantitatively identical before it becomes a magnet as it is after. If that's the case, which is 100% undeniable, then what defines a magnet is qualitative. What's the qualitative nature of a magnet? And a magnet is no different than saying a polarized objective object. Field polarization. When we have field polarization, we have point source object. When you have a point source object, you either have constructive interference or destructive interference. Constructive in the case of so-called magnetic repulsion, which is true magnetism, is you have multiplicative magnetism. You actually, you sit there and you try to push them together, you can't even get them close, yeah? Or we could say destructive magnetism, or we could say multiplicative dielectric. That's what everybody's missing. There's a magnetic field around a magnet. Well, you got half of it right. But the magnet isn't emitting anything. The field around it is the influence of the ether itself because the polarized object is causing polarization of the substrate which is around it in proximity thereof, which is, of course, the ether. And then we have ether polarization. And no branch of science has ever defined a field. In my opinion, that's a fact. So now that we have ether polarization and it exists around a magnet, you're only seeing half the picture. It's like an idiot child, you know, foolish child, excuse me. Only sees the puppet at a puppet show. He can't see really the strings, or if he can, he can't see the hand above it and the person behind it. Everybody's fascinated by the puppet like little children, but they can't see the puppet master. The puppet master, of course, is the dielectric, which is where magnetism comes from. The toroidal geometry, which influences, and of course it is a point source object, and it is polarized. But what does the polarization mean in the case of the three-dimensional force vector that defines magnetism? Polarization of what? Polarization of the conjugate field that makes up every field. You've seen this in a thousand plus videos I've made on the supercell. Polarization what? Polarization. Kind of like you divide out uh, uh, libs and, uh, uh, you know, the the right-wingers and the left-wingers. Polarization! It used to be kind of everybody like had a half a brain and they're right in the middle and now people are polarized. Like polarized society. And they're all people, right? You have the right-wingers here and the left-wingers over here. It's kind of a good analogy, isn't it? What would the polarization be in our analogy in the case of the magnet? Well, it's qualitative. It's not quantitative. So what's the polarization? Think again of the left wing, because they're, they're both people, the right wingies and the left wingies. I'm not interested in discussing politics, okay? You polarize them, you push them further apart. They used to kind of agree on common sense things, and now not anymore. Whoop! You've created polarization of society. <clears throat> okay? I'm with you. I'm with you. So what have we polarized in the case of the qualitative nature that defines a magnet? Quantitatively 100% identical, what you've done, just like the, the lefties and the righties, you've created polarization of the conjugate field. Before it became a magnet, the dielectric and the magnetic was everywhere, which way, a gazillion ways interlaced, you know, it was indivisible, because magnetism is the dielectric field. Now that you've made it polarized, You've polarized the magnetic and the dielectric. And this is where we get so-called uh, magnetic repulsion, which is true magnetism, and the thing incorrectly called magnetic attraction, which is not magnetism at all. Rather, we could say it's multiplicative dielectric, or we could say destructive, uh, de, uh, um, uh, destructive uh, magnetism, which is no different than saying multiplicative dielectric. You've polarized the conjugate field between the magnetic and the dielectric. This is true polarization defined and accurately explained as in the case of the magnet. And the entire universe, by the way, from one corner to the other, follows this conjugate field. Gravity is no different than what we're ignorantly calling magnetic attraction. It's no different than electrostatic cling where you pull your, like, your hot fluffy socks out of the out of the uh, dryer and they want to stick together and you pull them apart and you see that uh, static charge between static charge so-called magnetic attraction it's not magnetism at all so-called gravity these are all the exact same phenomena okay so a magnet is polarized and it's multiplicative but it's no different than that phenomena called gravity mother nature is really really simple it's that human beings unfortunately are really 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 not that bright
And they're not interested in the big questions. Well, they kind of are, but they don't want to spend time on it like I have. So there's a simple answer for the definition of polarization and also to the plane of inertia. Because there's no branch of science has ever defined what polarization means or is in the case of a magnet. And it's really important to understand that. I hope I've made that simple. I tried to keep it really dumbed down. I hope you like that. If you like this video, you can always contact me. My information is in the description below. Any donation is always very warmly welcome. I greatly appreciate it. Anything at all, even a buck matters. Yeah. But if I uh, helped uh, enlighten you in any small factor, that's also too wonderful. Thank you.